Greetings, YouTube math family. I have developed an unhealthy obsession with the Fresnel integrals. I've solved them numerous times and made lots of videos on them. I've solved them using the complex, assorted complex Gaussian function. I solved them using Feynman's trick applied to a very exotic integral function. I solved them using the Laplace transform. I solved them using the gamma function and even extended that to the case of the generalized Fresnel integrals. And I even made a video on using Ramanujan's master theorem on how to solve them. Have I linked all of these videos in the description box? No way. Too many videos to link and I'm a bit lazy. So you, you guys can just, you know, browse the channel to look for those videos. And while looking for them, you'll find a plethora of really cool math videos on integration and, well, different, differential equations. So it is pretty fun. And some physics videos here and there as well, just sprinkled here and there. So if you're new to the channel, this would be a good time to subscribe. And one more thing, I haven't solved these integrals using contour integration yet, which is sort of the OG way on how to on how to solve the Fresnel integrals. So that's what we're going to do today. So sit back, relax, and enjoy some beautiful complex analysis. The first thing we need is a complex valued function f of z that when integrated on a closed contour would render us the Fresnel integrals. So we'll define f of z in this case as e to the negative z squared. So we have this complex Gaussian function as our f of z. And I know what you're thinking, why not e to the negative i z squared? Because by Euler's formula, we would get cosine z squared and sine z squared. So wouldn't that help? Well, yeah, sure. But the solution development using this complex Gaussian function works pretty well too. I mean, equally well. And it's very cool. It's a very nice solution development indeed. And what contour are we planning to use? Well, let me first present to you the complex plane. So I have the real axis here and the imaginary axis here. So x here equals r e z and y equals i m z. And the contour we're going to use is a pizza slice contour. That sounds quite nice. So the, by a pizza slice, we mean a sector of a circle of radius r. So if here's the origin, then I have the straight line being one radial line. Then I have another radial line. And here's the arc part of this sector. And the measure of this sector is pi by four radians. And I'm going to call the entire contour C. Okay, cool. Oh, and of course, we have to traverse this in the counterclockwise sense. Now, if we integrate along the closed contour C, the function e to the negative z squared with respect to z, e to the negative z squared is an entire function, meaning it's holomorphic in the entire complex plane. So that means by the, by the residue theorem, we get zero. And that's pretty much it. I believe that's a job well done. No, not at all. We still have to evaluate the two Fresnel integrals. And for that, we're going to have to break down the integral over C into its components. So we have the integral over c being equal to one integral on the real line, that is the integral from zero to r. And then we have another integral over this arc that I'm gonna call uppercase gamma. And then we have another integral over this straight line that I'm gonna call lowercase gamma. And there's an interesting thing about the integral over lowercase gamma. What if I say that gamma actually represented a straight line moving from the origin outwards towards the point on the circumference of the circle we have here. In that case, the reverse direction could be called negative gamma, or better yet, we're just evaluating the negative of the integral along gamma. So I'm going to introduce a negative sign here, where we're actually treating gamma to traverse from the origin all the way up to a point on the circumference of the circle. Okay, cool. So first things first, we're interested in the limiting case of r going to infinity. Now, what happens to the integral on the real line? Well, the limit of the integral from 0 to r as r tends to infinity equals the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative x squared, where x replaces z because we're on the real line. And this thing is, of course, the Gaussian integral, which sorts out to 1 half of root pi. Now, what about the integral over lowercase gamma? Well, we could parameterize the curve gamma using a t variable and represent each complex number on lowercase gamma as z being equal to, okay, if we think in terms of the polar form, 
the argument of all complex numbers on the straight line here equals pi by 4. So we have e to the i times pi by 4, and it's the modulus of the complex numbers here that's changing from 0 to r. So that means we have t times e to the i pi by 4, where t here is bound between 0 and r. And that means the integral over lowercase gamma equals the integral from 0 to r of, let's see what we have here, e to the negative z squared, right? So what exactly would z squared be? z squared equals t squared times e to the i pi by 2. So that means we have negative t squared times e to the i pi by 2. But wait, what exactly is e to the i pi by 2 as per Euler's formula? Well, e to the i pi by 2 equals cosine pi by 2 plus i times sine pi by 2. And we know that this thing here is 0 and this thing here is 1. So that means this thing equals i. So that means we have the differential element dz as well. How does that transform? Again, let me just move things around a little bit. So this implies that dz equals e to the i pi by 4 dt. Okay, cool. So that's what we have here. And e to the i pi by 2 is, of course, i. So that means we have e to the negative i t squared. And recall this is this is the candidate for our Fresnel integrals because e to the negative i t squared equals cosine t squared minus i times sine t squared. So that means we have both our target integrals over here. And we have e to the i pi by 4 times the integral from 0 to r of e to the negative i t squared dt equal to the integral over lowercase gamma. And of course, we're interested in the limiting case of r going to infinity. So that would give us the limit of the integral over gamma as r tends to infinity equal to e to the i pi by 4 times the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative i t squared dt. Now what about the parameterization of this uppercase gamma curve? Well, we have gamma of t, and every complex number on this curve has the same modulus. So writing them in the polar form, we have the modulus being equal to r, the radius of the circle, and it's the argument that's varying. So we have e to the i times t, where t here is bound between pi by 4 and 0. Okay, cool, sounds good. And we're interested in z squared, so we have z squared equal to r squared times e to the 2 times i t. And we also need the differential element, so there's a further implication that dz equals i times r times e to the i t dt. So the integral over the arc gamma is actually an integral from 0 to pi by 4 of e to the negative z squared, and z squared is now r squared times e to the 2 times i t. And we also have the differential element giving us i r e to the i t dt. And now we can expand this exponential function up here using Euler's formula. So in that case, we would get the integral from 0 to pi by 4 of e to the negative r squared times cosine 2t plus i times sine of 2t, terribly sorry about that, times i times r times e to the i t dt. And now let me use the properties of the exponential function and write this as the product of two exponential functions. So we have the integral from 0 to pi by 4 of e to the negative r squared times cosine 2t again, terribly sorry about that, times e to the negative i r squared sine of 2 times t times i times r times e to the i t dt. And now let me collect these two complex exponential functions and then combine them into a single one, again, using the properties of exponential function multiplication. So we have integral 0 to pi by 4 of e to the negative r squared times cosine 2t times i times r times e to the i factored out, and we're left with t minus r squared sine of 2t integration with respect to t. Now it's time for everyone's favorite integral vanishing act. 
We'll consider the absolute values of the left and the right hand side, and we know that the integral, the absolute value of the integral over contour gamma of a function f is less than or equal to the integral over the same contour gamma of the absolute value of that very same function. So this implies that the integral, the absolute value of the integral over gamma is less than or equal to the integral from zero to pi by four of the absolute value of everything that's the integrand. Now the absolute value operator can be applied to each function individually in the product. So we have absolute value r times absolute value i. r is a positive real number. We don't need the absolute value sign and the absolute value of i is just one. Then we have the absolute value of e to the negative r squared times cosine two t. Again, a positive real number. So we don't need the absolute value sign. So let me just write this one more time because the first time I wrote it, it looked quite hideous. And then I have the absolute value of e to the negative i r squared times sine of two times t integration with respect to t. Wait, terribly sorry about that. We in fact have i times t minus r squared times sine of two times t. Doesn't really matter because we have e to the i times a real number and the absolute value of e to the i times a real number is always gonna be one. Okay, cool. So all of, this, all of this implies that the absolute value of the integral over gamma is less than or equal to the integral from zero to pi by four of r times e to the negative r squared times cosine two t dt. And remember, we're interested in the limiting case of r going to infinity. So what happens there? Well, for the integrand, you can verify it quite easily using L'Hopital's rule and it's honestly quite obvious, we have e to the negative r squared something times r itself. So the exponential function would, would collapse to zero faster than the, than the function r would grow. And again, you can verify this using L'Hopital's rule. And it approaches zero as r approaches infinity. Okay, cool. So this implies that the limit of the absolute value of the integral over gamma as r tends to infinity equals zero, meaning that the integral itself evaluates to zero in that limit. And now it's time to piece everything together. So we knew that this thing crashed down to zero because, well, the function is holomorphic. And this thing crashed to zero in the limit as r tends to infinity. And we're left with zero equal to the integral from zero to r in the limit as r tends to infinity was the Gaussian. So we have one half of root pi, terribly sorry about that, minus the integral, wait, we had e to the i times pi by four times the integral from zero to infinity of e to the negative i t squared dt. So this implies that the integral from zero to infinity of cosine t squared minus i times sine t squared dt equals one half of root pi times e to the negative i times pi by four. And you can expand e to the negative i times pi by four using Euler's formula. You would get cosine pi by four minus i times sine of pi by four, both being one by root two. So this implies on equating the real and imaginary parts that the integral from zero to infinity of cosine t squared dt equals one half of root pi by two, and this also equals the integral from zero to infinity of sine t squared dt. And that was absolutely beautiful. This was a very cool application of complex analysis. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something from the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Do drop me a follow on Instagram as well. And in case you're learning something, you like the effort I'm putting out, consider supporting me on Patreon. All links in the description box. Thank you. See you next time.